Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the Great Challenges broadcast sponsored by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I'm Greg Masters, and I have the privilege of moderating today's Power Pack panel on patient activation measure. So up front, let's uh, invite our guests to in introduce themselves by name and title. And let's start to the and whip right in the uh, Google Hangout strip, and that would say, Emily, why don't you kick it off for us? Okay. Hi, um, my name is Emily kramer Goinkoff. I am very happy to be here. I'm a co-founder of Emily's Entourage, which is a nonprofit foundation that raises funds and awareness for cystic fibrosis research. And I work at the Penn Social Media and Health Innovation Lab. I also am a patient with cystic fibrosis, um, and I, I do patient advocacy, and I speak um, from that perspective. That's great. How about Judith? Yes, good morning and good afternoon. Um, I'm Judith Hibbard from the University of Oregon. Um, I am the uh, lead author on the patient activation measure. I'm a health services researcher and um, my area for many years has been um, really focusing on how patients can have more uh, information and control over what happens to them in healthcare. And Rebecca? Good afternoon. It's Rebecca Burkholder here. I'm Vice President of uh, Health Policy at the National Consumers League, where we work on a variety of healthcare issues. And over the last several years, we've been heading up the Script Your Future campaign, which is a public awareness campaign to raise a level of awareness of the importance of medication adherence. And Sandra. Sandra Elliott, Director for Consumer Technology and Service Development at Meridian Health, but I'm also the Executive director of Impact Health, which is a company where we develop tools and technologies to help patients better engage in uh, compliance as well as have more meaningful conversations with their physicians. I'm very excited to be here today. Great, great. Glad to have you. And Suzanne? Uh, good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Mitchell. I am a family doctor and palliative care physician and I'm an assistant professor at Boston University. And my areas of research are in uh, clinician-patient communication and its impact on health service use and health outcomes. Happy to be here. Glad you could make it and welcome everyone. Today we'll dig into something that surfaced in an earlier Great Challenges discussion on the role of the patient, that is evaluating and balancing the role of activating or inspiring patients who are not yet what we would call engaged, per se. One tool, the Patient Activation Measure, also known as PAM, offers patients a way to self-evaluate their ability to engage in their care and share it with clinicians. And an article shared last week in the Wall Street Journal reported savings of $260 to $3,700 per patient per year when clinical sites use the patient activation measure. So does this mean the tool is working? What concerns are out there? Are there other tools in use? Ultimately, how do we achieve an engaged and activated clinical team and patient? So today we've gathered, the TEDMED crew has gathered for us some top thinkers and thought leaders on this subject. So let's jump right into the questions. And as a reminder, we'll take questions on social media through the broadcast. Just tag your questions with the hashtag great challenges. Judith, you published the patient activation measure results in 2004. Since then, we've witnessed a near global economic meltdown, followed by the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, including the high tech provisions for EHR adoption the labored passage of the Affordable Care Act, unrelenting attempts to defund the act in a Supreme Court challenge as to its con constitutionality, with the uh, Affordable Care Act's emphasis on accountable care organizations, patient-centered medical homes, and other demonstrations and pilots and care delivery innovation, it seems like a 10-year seasoning process may be at a tipping point for more widespread adoption of PAM or PAM-like technology. Why don't you set the frame here and describe to us what PAM is and what does it actually measure and or enable? Yes. 
So um, we started this because um, we understood that the patient actually represents a very important asset that we um, we aren't fully um, engaging with, and uh, so started the process by thinking about how we could measure um, the the patient's contribution and the patient's um, ability, ability and um, their uh, uh, attitudes and beliefs about um, uh, managing their health. So uh, we came up with a, a, um, a 10 item, we have a 13 item uh, PAM that uh, measures an individual's knowledge, skill, and confidence for managing their health and their health care. And having measurement really has meant we've learned so much about why people do and don't engage. Uh, for example, um, the, the measure is a 0 to 100 scale. And what we've uh, uh, learned is that uh, people who measure low on this uh, scale um, they tend to feel overwhelmed with the task of managing their health. Um, they have very little confidence in their ability to manage their health and they're discouraged because they've had a lot of experience with failure. Um, they may not even understand what their role is in the care process. And so this is pretty important I think for clinicians to understand about their patients to have these insights because too often um, clinicians give patients you know, an a, a enormous list of things that they have to do to, uh, of how they, to change their life and to do things differently. And um, from the patient's point of view, this can feel like asking them to climb Mount Everest. Um, and essentially, uh, when clinicians don't understand where patients are beginning or where they're coming from, um, they can be setting them up for failure. And what we really want is to set patients up for success. Um, and so that has been our main approach. And I think that the thing that is really different about the approach is that we use measurement very uh, consciously and, um, and we use it to meet patients where they are. Um, and, and and help them uh, to move forward. Um, in healthcare, we measure what matters. And if we really think that this is important, it has to be part of uh, what we're measuring and using that measurement to improve um, and personalize care. Perfectly said. Measure what matters. So, Suzanne, you're currently using this tool at Boston Medical Center. Uh, what's the response like from patients, and how does your clinical team prepare for using it? So we are using it at Boston Medical Center in our research studies, trying to understand first how to use it and how to use the information that it provides. So we first used it with one of our studies in care transitions, our project re-engineered discharge, uh, where we are studying um, a structured discharge plan to see how that might impact uh, patients activation and how well they're able to take care of themselves following a hospitalization. Um, a hospitalization is often you know a very big event in somebody's life and often um, diminishes at least temporarily people's skills for learning new information and being able to master new self-care responsibilities so we are using um, the pa we first used the patient activation measure to see if it was linked to um, an individual's risk for being readmitted to the hospital uh, shortly after being discharged for um, a hospitalization or what we call 30-day readmission. And what we found was that there was not just an association, uh, an association but a dose effect time, like a graded association, so that compared to people who had the highest level of activation, uh, those at the lowest were the most at risk of being readmitted um, unexpectedly, um, with a slightly lower risk for those as they went up in their activation level. So what that means is that when people are able to participate and learn what they what their discharge plan is, their likelihood for readmission is reduced. So any improvement 
in that preparation process and their ability to learn their discharge plan will reduce their risk for uh, an unexpected return to the hospital. So at this point we're trying to look at whether our project RED intervention actually does increase patients activation levels. So we're still uh, the we're still learning how that's going to be used in everyday practice. Thank you. Uh, now we've heard some response to the Wall Street Journal article uh, you both were featured in that healthcare cannot s stop just at having a patient evaluation tool as the only resource for evaluating patients' ability to engage in their health. Uh, Rebecca, the National Consumers League has expressed some concerns with patient evaluation instruments, particularly things like the FICO medication adherence score. What do you look for as good activation as a good activation resource or technique? Sure. Well, for any good activation resource or technique, there really needs to be transparency. So it's very clear on what is being measured and how it is being measured. When the FICO adherence score first came out several years ago, there was some concern about how that was derived. Um, the adherence score, as we understand it, was really a predictive analysis that took publicly available data such as age, gender, income level, car ownership, job status, and took that and analyzed it and then predicted whether people would be adherent or not. So there was some concern on the behalf of consumers about privacy issues, about whether the score was actually accurate, and really how it would be used. Would insurance company use this to penalize consumers? Would they deny coverage? Would they increase premiums? So as we look at this, there's a difference between using the FICO adherence score to support patients that might be you know, at risk for being non-adherent, or if it's being used to penalize patients um, and to blame and shame them. So when we think about techniques um, that are scoring patients, we want to make sure that there's transparency, that it's clear how it's being used, what it's being used for, that there's trust between the healthcare provider and the patient as this is being used, and that it's actually also collecting information from the patient him or herself. We know there's um, tools out there that actually measure specifically medication adherence that ask patients about their behaviors, about their beliefs about medication adherence, and then taking that really personalize the approach, um, whether cost may be a barrier, or whether side effects may, be, may be a barrier. So we do think it's important that any tool or technique in the end is providing resources and support to the patient. So Emily, uh, what does this mean um, to patients? Well, you know, I think that for patients like me with chronic illnesses like cystic fibrosis, being a patient is a full-time job, except that it's not my full-time job. I also have a bunch of other jobs. And in addition to jobs, you know, I have hobbies and goals and and a social life and, and all sorts of other things. So I think, you know, for me, um, my goal in my health is to be able to fully engage in the rest of my life. And so if this is the jumping off point to start a conversation, I think that's great. But I think overall, this is just a jumping off point and that there has to be efforts to align values and understand life context and, and goals. And that often involves a much more nuanced and rich relationship with a provider. Um, so I think for patients, you know, if this education and understanding are certain are certainly really important and, and sort of getting a sense of where a patient is is really important for the provider but um, I think it's just the beginning well said so thank you everyone for those introductory remarks to those of you uh, of you joining us online what do you think is working perhaps missing the mark when it comes to patient activation Remember to tag your questions with the hashtag Great Challenges and we'll endeavor to answer them live. Now, Sandra, as the health tech company, you have a lot to benefit from every patient becoming an active patient. Yes. What are ways your solutions enhance patient engagement? Well, I think before I, I talk about the actual uh, technology itself, I do want to kind of go back into a couple of comments that were made. And I think it is important to understand that within a healthcare environment, we're, we're, we love linear processes. A leads to B leads to C kind of thinking. 
But I think, you know, what we're talking about is behavior. One is assessing where people are, and I think we've lost a skill. Um, and I think PM helps us begin to have that conversation again with patients. But I think, um, as Emily mentioned before, it's context. Understanding the context of how behavior impacts daily life. And that's the approach that we've tried to take in developing tools that will help people be more compliant with either their medication or their treatment or really monitoring their own behaviors because at the end of the day behavior is is not clean it's messy and you know at the same time everybody has their own goals so the question is how do you develop something and uh, in such a way that really engages a patient to understand how they're doing and how well they're doing but more importantly doesn't complicate their life it gives them the information that they need um, is not a barrier to their day-to-day -day activities and can easily be integrated into their their um, their normal routine because at the end of the day as, as Emily said she has goals and dreams and and her job isn't trying to be a full-time patient so I think our approach has always been put the tools and the technology in the hands of the consumer make sure we understand how they're going to use it in all different types of scenarios different conditions different patient populations understand how we can make that easy for them and what are those contextual um, buy-in points that help a patient feel comfortable that this is a tool that they themselves can uh, actually use going back to one of the key critical components in PAM is really understanding how much control that patient actually does have and can have in their own management of their own condition and I think that's the critical point every technology company needs to focus in on is what's the problem you're trying to solve and who's trying to use the technology and make sure they are part of that design and development process and that's what we've done from a uh, health system perspective along with Impact Health. Thanks. Uh, thank you Sandra. So we, uh, we have our first question via social media and that comes from William Dudley who asked via Google Plus, Suzanne do you see PAM as an intervention or as an assessment? That's a great question and I think the answer is it depends on what your what question you're asking uh, or what your intention is, what your goal is. So I think it's, pos it's totally conceivable that you could use the PAM with a patient and show them their result and ask them what they think about that and really involve the patient more in the results. I think my experience using the PAM or seeing the PAM used has been more to inform the clinicians or the healthcare environment on how to tailor what, pe what people need. So I think person-centered care and person-centered interactions and communication are very much of interest right now. We're trying to figure out how to personalize people's care because one size doesn't fit all as everybody has said today you know every person has their own individual life and so I think we could see the PAM used as a way of personalizing care as a way of informing patients about where they're at and what they need um, and it could also be used as an assessment of whether a particular intervention has worked successfully to increase a person's level of or their ability to engage in their managing their own health care Greg, can I jump in here? Absolutely, please do. Okay. Uh, so yes, um, PAM is an, uh, an assessment as well as uh, it can be used to frame a, an intervention. Um, uh, what we have developed is an approach where we see the patient is kind of on a journey and um, that uh, people um, that we want to help them move along on that journey. And so people who are measuring low on the scale, we start out with smaller steps. Um, we understand that they're more passive about their health, so we use more kind of outreach and active outreach and more um, kind of high touch. Uh, for example, on the um, care transitions, when people leave the hospital, they have a lot of um, instructions. They and we know that the people who are um, uh, low activated are feeling overwhelmed with this process. So we help them by um, helping prioritize. If you can only do two things, you know these are the most important, um, and then maybe reaching out to them more often um, after they uh, leave the hospital, or maybe even home visits, uh, whereas higher activated patients um, may uh, just get phone calls. 
um, or other kinds of resources. Um, so the idea is um, really to help people by breaking things down into smaller steps uh, when they're less activated to give them kind of permission not to do everything right now. And, um, and what we have observed is that when people um, do start to experience success, their motivation increases. And uh, that, uh, we've seen that over and over again, and that is the, uh, where we want to uh, then people are ready for the next challenge. Um, but we, um, we think that um, this kind of approach, and, and it's been um, shown in the literature, actually does increase um, activation. And the very best news about this is that we see them, that patients who start lowest on the scale with the appropriate intervention, um, they increase the most. And that's very exciting to see. Thank you, Judith. Now for another question, uh, Marcy asks on Twitter, how can we engage high cost, high risk patients in the ER to empower them to take ownership of their disease and wellness. We would like to, Sandra, do you have a thought there? Yeah, actually I think one of the critical components which um, it comes to mind and we've done a number of different projects within uh, our ER patients is really understanding which patient population you're targeting when you're thinking about those high cost chronic conditions. So for example, is it the COPD or the, the pulmonary patient? Is it the heart failure patient? And really understanding what's potentially driving them into the emergency uh, room. And many times it's the simple, I've just been uh, starting to struggle with breathing. It's Friday night. It, you know, I, I can't get into my doctor or have a call uh, with my physician. Um, and I start getting anxious and it gets tougher and tougher to breathe. So you may see those patients come in. So the question is not necessarily how do we engage them, but better understanding what their true problems are and why they're using the emergency room and then beginning to create with the local community programs that the patients help develop that meet those patient needs right where they are. It may very well be that it's a patient who understands their condition extremely well and something just went awry and there's no way you could avoid that, that patient population coming into the emergency room. Or it could be just as simple as there's a, a lack of support within the community, however, you know, wherever they may be. And I think the critical component is really understand that patient population and why they're using the emergency room as a, a way to get care. And then you begin to understand where their level of, of it's not necessarily because they're not engaged or compliant. Maybe as, as uh, Judith has mentioned before, they may just not understand how to manage their condition. And that's a very different issue versus there's no primary care physician available on the weekend kind of thing. So you really need to understand that patient base before you decide what's the best approach to engage that patient. Thank you, Sandra. Here's another one from uh, Ross Hoffman and Heather Grace who ask similar questions on Google+. What are the leading drivers of patient engagement and did your research find a person's diagnosis impacts how activated they are likely to become and does the severity of their condition impact activation? Judith, I believe that's directed to you. Yes, okay. Um well, one of the interesting early findings was that um, mostly um, activation is not condition specific. Um, that when we look at adherence to medication and we see who is uh, uh, most adherent, it's, it is the higher activated uh, regardless of what condition. And you, and you look across the conditions, it's pretty much the same. Um, there are some conditions where there's an average PM score that's a little higher or a little lower. And I think that's because we're, what we're measuring is uh, individuals, um, their, uh, uh, their, their job in managing their health. And so some conditions are more demanding. <laughs> it takes more effort to manage it. And so they, those patients will have a little bit on average lower PM score. But um, and then when uh, the condition becomes more severe, then we do see 
uh, lower PAM scores because, again, it's harder to manage on a day-to-day -day basis when you have um, higher severity. Thank you, Judith. So this, this one stimulated some responses by our panel. Um, Suzanne, you want to make a comment as well? Well, I just wanted, the, in response to the, you know, what what's driving in, you know, engagement, I, I think that um, people really are seek and need several things. I call it my my differential diagnosis or when I'm trying to figure out what is help, what is what barrier is a patient facing in in helping them engage with their care and I think that people are largely driven by four things in terms of their interactions with healthcare providers in the healthcare system I think they are looking for connection to the people that are taking care of them um, there's good evidence if people have trust in their providers and where and they believe they're getting the best care they could possibly get in the right care for them that they are much more likely to engage. People are looking for a sense of um, clarity. You know, if they don't understand or they don't have actionable information, clarity about what they need to do, it will be difficult for them to engage and succeed and could even lead to more experiences with failure. Um, they need to have some sense of confidence that they can actually do what's being asked of them and so even though they may know and it may be important to them to do uh, what has been asked of them if they don't feel confident that they can succeed then it will be difficult for them to get into action and um, I think that you know when I'm trying to think about what is happening with my patient that those are the things I think about confidence control connection and clarity and um, I've had people tell me when I've asked them what was it like for you when you were first diagnosed with diabetes um, they said it was like all the leaves fell off my tree and I got stuck there you know they can get stuck in that moment and have a difficult time getting into action until they've had a chance to you know recognize their own sense of empowerment so I think again the patient activation measure tells us where people are at um, but it doesn't it isn't the entire conversation that we the things that drive people's engagement and behaviors are about their experiences with their health care how they perceive their care to be best for them and then whether or not they can actually follow through on that advice that's a perfect pivot to you Emily yeah, that is. So I think that, you know, for, as a patient with a serious, um, complex illness, cystic fibrosis and, and cystic fibrosis related diabetes, for me personally, what is most important for my engagement is having a team that has a really holistic view of me, not just as a patient, but as a person. And so, you know, we, they understand my values and they understand my goals and we can sort of align our, um, align what we're working towards and it's really collaborative and it's a partnership and I think um, for an illness like mine that requires three four hours every single day when I'm healthy of treatment that 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 kind of um, you know shared vision and shared goal is is really important because if I didn't um, if I didn't feel like my voice was heard and I didn't feel like my treatments were all designed to improve my life and not just my health um, or my health in the context of my life there's no chance that that I would you know be on board so for me that holistic view and that partnership where I am a driver of my health and my health care and, and you know as the person who's doing it outside of clinic which is the vast majority of my treatment I think that's really important Thanks, Emily. Rebecca, you had some thoughts on adherence? Sure. I think one thing to pick up on is this issue of building confidence in patients. And patients need to remember that they are the expert on their own health, particularly when it comes to medications. They know what works. They know what side effects they are having. They know the barriers that they're having. To, so to really make sure that they're sharing that expertise. And then with that, one thing we are always uh, encouraging, both from the healthcare provider side and the patient side, is to make sure they're having that conversation um, and that 
healthcare providers are not just asking patients, are you taking your medications or are you doing a certain treatment, but to really be asking them, what's the most challenging part of you in taking this medication or taking this treatment so that they can have an open-ended conversation. Um, most doctors are really terrible at um, estimating whether their patients are adherent to their medications, adherent to their treatments. So what we think, you know, although these tools can be really helpful, what it really comes down to is that conversation between the patient and the healthcare provider. Thank you, and trust keeps coming up for me. Trust in the turbulence. So um, how about, uh, um, let's uh, throw this question out again from, um, from Twitter. Jennifer Celio asks on Twitter, Rebecca, how does family caregiver activation and engagement fit into and affect patient activation? It's an excellent question, just because the family caregiver population in this country is just going to continue to grow as our population continues to age. So it's interesting that family caregivers can be one of the predictors of better adherence for patients. As we've talked to patients, there's been studies that have been done when there's someone in the home right with the patient or helping to take care of the patient that can remind them to take their medication that can remind them about the questions they may have uh, for the healthcare provider that can go with them to a visit, that that could really help the patient and encourage the patient and um, make sure that they're doing what they need to do. What's also interesting is that family caregivers themselves, though, face certain barriers, that they are sometimes the least adherent patients because they're juggling a lot. They're taking care of a loved one. They're also trying to take care of themselves. So it's really important to remember that family caregivers need to be addressed in this conversation, but that they are also facing their own health challenges. Thank you, Rebecca. Sandra? Yeah, I, I wanted to add to that because I think the caregiver is a critical component, and particularly as it relates to the technology and some of the tools. And we find that it's actually um, uh, more of the caregiver using the, the compliance-related tools to really be able to see how well mom or dad, we call it the mom factor, how well mom or dad um, are doing in, in staying compliant with their medications. So they're not bugging the crap out of them every day, if you will, but really understanding kind of what's going on with mom or dad or, or a child kind of remotely. So we see that the technology is exactly uh, uh, targeted at the caregiver as well as the patient themselves, more so to be able to um, really give a good feel as a tool, good feel for where an individual patient may be, but it also is that um, they can actually have some more intelligent conversations outside of just what's going on with their health because they can actually see what's going on remotely. So I think it's important to, to note that some of the tools and technologies that are coming out are really um, targeted at the patient, but more importantly is I think that they're also enabling caregivers to be a little bit more efficient in how well they can help and assist their family members take care of themselves. Thank you. And, and Judith? Yeah, I, I wanted to actually address both um, the question of the caregiver, but I wanted to go back to the issue about adherence. Um, one of the uh, interesting um, findings that we had early on was um, that when activation goes up, um, multiple behaviors improve. And that was really surprising to us at first. Um, but then it, it sort of made sense in that when when people start to feel more in control and uh, feel more able around managing their health, that they're going to do multiple things in a more positive way. And oftentimes, it's not, um, it may not be that you're working on adherence, but that adherence will improve as people start to um, feel like they can manage their health better. Um, and I also wanted to uh, comment on the caregiver. Um, we, we've actually done some work on this issue of how um, activated, uh, able, and um, the, the caregiver skills in managing the health of their uh, loved one. And we have a caregiver, PAM, um, which is maybe a little less well known, but it's starting to be used um, in patient-centered medical homes and um, in other settings where we are counting on the caregiver who actually um, carry uh, out the care plan and work with the patient. Um, so that's another resource that um, is available. Thank you, Judith. Emily, what do you see as the biggest motivator for patients when it comes to self-monitoring? What can providers do to provide that? 
So, you know, for me personally, the, the treatment that I do outside of clinic, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be alive if I didn't do it. So it, it's not, you know, it's not optional. It's, it's absolutely required. But I think what motivates me to, to do, you know, three or four hours of treatments every single day, um, day in, day out, no breaks, no vacations, is you know, is really my desire to engage richly in the rest of my life and to be productive and, you know, to, to work and to go to school and to run my foundation and to have, you know, really rewarding relationships. And you have to feel healthy to do that. And so um, my motivation is, is to be able to minimize my health issues as much as possible and, and really be an active and productive member of society. Thank you, Emily. So uh, we have a, a Twitter question here from uh, Intake Me. Greg, what about a doctor activation measure that is a crowdsourced rating by patients? Anyone? Uh, I'll, I'll take that. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a, um, a, an interesting approach, um, the crowdsource. We do have a clinician support for patient activation. And um, it, it's a, a questionnaire that is like the PAM. It is uh, aimed at the clinician. And it says, as a clinician, how important is it to you that your chronic illness patients be able to, and then there's a lot of kind of PAM items. That um, was uh, fielded first here in the US and in the UK. Um, the responses were remarkably similar in both countries. And, uh, and since then, we've found that it is um, the measure for clinicians is predictive of their behaviors of being kind of uh, patient support kind of behaviors. They're significantly more likely to engage in these. And I think it's because they really, um, that clinicians who score high on this measure really see the value of the, what the patient is bringing to the process. Um, and so they invest their time and effort into it. Um, so it is predictive of uh, whether they, um, you know, engage the patient in uh, agenda setting, in problem solving, in all of these things that we're trying to encourage clinicians to do. Um, we've also seen that it is predictive of whether their patient PAM scores are going up or not. And that was pretty exciting. Can I can I add a comment to that? Um, and just say that, um, you know, I think that clinicians become discouraged uh, in engaging patients in those kinds of conversations about problem solving, goal setting. Um, one, because they don't know how to recognize when they're successful and they don't have the training to engage in those discussions efficiently. And so, you know, when I, I do, I teach motivational interviewing. Um, at, in to mostly primary care clinicians on frontline settings and my my message to them is not time that you lack it's skill and efficiency that you lack in having those conversations and it's also the ability to recognize success and if you can't recognize your success you're going to be hard pressed it's the same as a patient's experience with failure you're going to be hard pressed to keep going after that conversation if you don't feel like you're getting anywhere or being rewarded for it I think that you know what uh, goes on the dashboard for anybody who knows what a dashboard is it's it's like a report card that clinicians get I promise you that engaging patients in these conversations isn't on that dashboard and so clinicians uh, don't feel similarly to patients they don't feel equipped nor uh, are they able to recognize what um, what success looks like and so we need to do more on two ends one in providing those skills and helping clinicians recognize that it is a skill just like you know a surgical procedure or or any of the other you know procedure oriented skills that we learn we need to learn how to have these conversations effectively and efficiently so that we do recognize success with our patients and, and I think that you know those are the two sides of the equation that have to come together for shared decision making to actually happen. Key points. Thank you, Suzanne. <clears throat> James asks on Google Plus, 
couldn't we use motivational interviewing techniques during the visit to tell us that patients are not confident in engaging in their care rather than investing time and money in a whole new workflow with a survey? Yes, yes, I would say yes. Uh, you know, the two things that I tell primary care providers, I tell medical assistants when I'm working with people who are in the medical home transformation process, you know, all you have to do really to find out where a patient is at is ask them, you know, just like we use scales of 1 to 10 for pain, you know, we could say it for, on 1 to 10, you know, how important is this uh, you know, exercise program for you. How important is it for you to quit smoking today? Um, and how confident are you that you can do it? Because readiness is really got to be about a high level of importance as well as a high level of confidence. And I think that we, you know, for those folks who end up in the emergency room, our dual eligible complex care patients, um, some of this becomes quite overwhelming. And, and so asking them, you know, how important and how confident is this particular thing for you will help inform the clinician where they're at, where they need to go to help their patient move to the next level. We ask big things of patients things they're not ready for and so we have to work with them setting small action plans helping them build their sense of confidence that they can actually make a difference in their own health and in their own future fortunately the research is encouraging so we also have some uh, interest by both Rebecca and Sandra in the question Rebecca let's start with you yeah I just wanted to add to the issue about motivational interviewing that can be really helpful and you know with that we know pharmacists sometimes use that we've been talking a lot about clinicians and maybe uh, mostly physicians but also to remember for the patient it can be anybody on that healthcare team whether it's the pharmacist sometimes they're the most accessible healthcare professional to a patient whether it's a nurse um, you know whoever it may be in that healthcare team that they feel most comfortable talking to so just want to remember that point and also the issue about when we use these tools or um, these techniques to know that patients change over time as far as their circumstances as far as their adherence level so to remember Remember that we're, if we're using these tools, that we're doing it over time, that we're resurveying or reevaluating patients on this because perhaps they become a family caregiver or they have um, change in insurance or just something that they have a new job, something changes in their life that changes their ability to engage in their health. So just want to make sure we continue to keep those issues as we look at this in a very holistic way. Sandra? And I think one of the things that, that we have a tendency to kind of forget here is that the, because we get, we get caught up in all of our, our technical um, kind of jargon, but I think that the, the reality is that the patient-physician relationship should be a very intimate relationship. The unfortunate thing is that you have a very, you know, 10 minutes or less basically to create that intimacy where you can begin to share information. And I think one of the things uh, which Suzanne mentioned earlier is that there isn't a lot of training at the physician level in how to actually walk into a room and assess the situation where that patient is by their, not only their words, but their body language and understanding where they are. And I think that's one of those things that we've kind of lost that physicians used to have the time to be able to do that over time and, and have some more conversation. But it's almost like I now have to take every piece of information as I walk in that door as a clinician and truly see how much I can figure out what's going on with that patient and start a dialogue. And it's not to say that we shouldn't have uh, tools that help us assess where a patient is in an engagement level or to, to do motivational interviewing, but in order to actually have an interchange, you've got to be as vulnerable as the patient is and begin to understand where they are and how I can best interact with them and see what's going on with them. Because at the end of the day, as Emily mentioned, it's those things that are going on in her daily life that are either uh, uh, making her feel good about herself uh, because she's meeting her goals, and uh, whether they're personal goals or foundation goals, or there are barriers for those things. And if the health is part of that barrier, then that clinician should be working with her to figure out how do I remove that barrier? How do I make it easier for you to take care of yourself so you can live your life? And I think we have a tendency to forget it's about living life and everything that we should do should be a tool or a technique that helps us do that and do it in a very, very short period of time because that's all we have right now. Uh, we just don't have that kind of time to be able to do that within a clinician's office. Well said. Judith, you had some thoughts as well? Yeah, I wanted to get a talk um, about that um, motivational interviewing. I think it's a great tool. It, um, it 
makes um, the discussion very patient-centered. Um, but it, and the use of the PAM goes excellent with um, the MI approach. But we did do a study where we um, where patients were um, coached by um, coaches who use MI and the PAM and another group of coaches who did not use the PAM, but they did use um, motivational interviewing. And even with that kind of high bar of uh, coaching with MI, we still saw a significant um, improvement in outcomes and in activation level when they used um, the measurement and they, they were able to really personalize um, their coaching and understand their patients more. Uh, I think the other thing about um, uh, the um, just assessing um, self-efficacy for uh, a particular behavior um, is uh, it, it's useful for knowing about that behavior but it's not going to help you understand um, how you're making progress how you as a clinician are doing with a whole population of patients when you have measurement that tells you this is where we were six months ago, this is where we are now. Um, and so it can become, eventually, hopefully, uh, part of that dashboard that clinicians are paying attention to. Um, and only measurement uh, will get us there. Thank you, Judith. Emily, had some thoughts? Yeah, so I just wanted to add that I think often, um, you know, time restrictions are sort of the easy scapegoat in these conversations. And while I understand that it's a very real you know, issue and it can be a big barrier for relationship building. I also think that sometimes when you invest in in the in the beginning of a of a relationship and you really you know you build a strong relationship with strong communication tools and trust. Sometimes those it, it becomes efficient later on. You know, more efficient even, and um, it makes some of the later conversations much easier and, and more streamlined. So um, I think. You know, it is a good investment in, in the very beginning. Thanks. I, I will actually comment on that. I, that. That's a question in the back of my mind has been ruminating is uh, how much of this is dependent on the payment paradigm. You know, these emerging direct practices or so-called concierge medicine or the traditional billing and collections medical group where you have the five or seven minute constraint on office visits. How much of that? is uh, actually factoring into to the adoption here. Judith, do you have some thoughts? Well, you know, as we move into a, a, a world where payment is more closely linked with outcomes, um, then there, um, there should be more interest in supporting patients um, because they're really the key <laughs> to the outcomes. Um, I, um, I was surprised in um, we evaluated a, a different way of paying uh, doctors um, in a large delivery system uh, where their their income was linked to um, uh, patient outcomes. And um, for many clinicians, uh, instead of seeing the patient as a potential um, avenue to, uh, to inc improving outcomes, they actually saw it as, um, they saw the patients as an obstacle. Um, and, and and I think it goes back to what um, uh, Suzanne was saying was that they lack the, the skills and the confidence. So with the payment model may be important um, to get the payment um, alignment that we need uh, to, to achieve better outcomes, but, um, but clinicians have to understand their role different and they have to have um, uh, skills uh, to do this and, and, and it is a lot like the journey that patients are on that clinicians are on a similar journey. Thank you Judith. Okay we're, uh, we're gonna circle back to this uh, question Celeste asks Suzanne could you describe uh, a time you leveraged Pam and created a personalized care experience? Um, well, I can give an example of what that would look like. Um, so, I mean, I think, so we work a lot in the care transition world where we're, we're working with people who are in the hospital, medically admitted for, a C, for emphysema exacerbation or cellulitis, 
and um, they are we're working with them on a care uh, transition what we call the re-engineered discharge and um, so one of the things that we're doing now is working with patients who have uh, also got comorbid depressive symptoms that means uh, that they may not necessarily have major depression as a as a co illness, but at the time of hospitalization, they're expre they're demonstrating major depressive uh, symptoms, and we want to try to help them uh, in their care transition to manage things safely and effectively at home. And so, one of the things that we're doing is to provide you know and tailor a three pronged approach that involves. Um, some patient navigation, which is just help me get that appointment with my doctor in five days after I get out of here. Um, so helping with uh, people to overcome those things, as well as self-management support, and then some cognitive behavior therapy to help with managing depressive symptoms. And, and then working with the patient to figure out which of those things they need and when they need it the most because um, the, the, the importance of each of those things may vary depending on how much their depression, their medical illness, or the changes in their health status are uh, impair or impacting their ability for self-management. And so we work with them to try to figure out what it is they need and target that um, that uh, interaction with them. We support them, we meet them in the hospital before they go home and then we meet that we call them on the telephone within two days and then we continue to call them for up to 12 weeks to help them manage their care. So that's an example we're using the PAM to see if our intervention increases activation um, but we're definitely working with our patients to try to tailor what their needs are to the uh, intervention. Thank you, Suzanne. And Sandra, you had some thoughts about the, the payment question? Yeah, I think one of, we, uh, Judith was mentioning some of the payment models and, you know, the fact that we're moving towards payment for outcomes. And unfortunately, <laughs> it's always been about the outcomes and the payment model has driven many times uh, what we do and why we do it. And, and it's an unfortunate situation. However, I think that we're at a point in time that the market is, is ready that if you do the right thing and you engage patients and you get them engaged in a way in which they feel comfortable and confident in themselves, as we've talked about, and can move from coping to commitment to really committed to their own health and living their life, the money will follow. It's kind of like a, a, an Apple model. When you've got the right device and people like it, the money will follow. It's designed something, a device, a, a tool, but an, or an actual conversation that connects with the person. And once you do that, then the money will follow. And I think that's been one of the things as we've talked about redesigning and restructuring healthcare. All we've really done is redesign and restructure the payment model. We have to think about how we take care of patients and support their lives, not just how we get paid. Thanks, Sandra. I'm, I'm thinking, follow your bliss here. So, <laughs> Come on. This is one off the script. I, I want to definitely want to uh, put out there before we go to the closing round. Um, ultimately, what options does a patient have if they cannot be activated, or if they cannot take on a medical task required for their health, such as an intensive post-operative wound care routine? Um, <laughs> maybe that's best sent to you, Suzanne. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's a there are a number of options depending on the healthcare environment that you're in, and your age, and uh, some of the other things. But if, if we do have people who are not able to take on those enormous res uh, responsibilities, and a lot of times we will supplement their care in some environment with additional caregivers such as visiting nurses. Um, if, if it's somebody who needs um, a lot of support, sometimes they might go temporarily to a skilled nursing facility. Um, so, and there's certainly a, a lot of folks that require that additional care. There are some innovative models for older persons that are very comprehensive that will provide a lot of in-home care. So. Um, 
We are an affiliated organization um, with Boston Medical Center's Commonwealth Care Alliance. We provide um, a very in-depth primary care uh, service to our uh, nursing home eligible patients who are living at home and can get um, a significant amount of in-home care including physical therapy, visiting nurse multiple times a day. So um, that model is not a fee-for-service model but uh, there are options to give people the care they need, but it very much varies depending on their insurance coverage, where they live, the state they live in, um, and other regulatory factors. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay, and we're going to go to our closing question here. It's been a fabulous conversation and exchange. So here it is. The great challenges all center around issues that can't be solved with a quick fix. And we have a long way to go in activating all patients in their health with so much complexity around this topic. What is the ultimate role for the patient in their health and how do we get there together? And let's whip through this starting with Emily left to right. Um, there is no person who has you know, a greater interest in, in being healthy than the patient. So I think the patient has to be a driver in their health care and ideally it's a partnership with all the providers and the patient and it's you know, collaboration where everyone is working towards the same goals. Thank you, Emily. Judith? So we have to think about it as a journey. Yes, not everybody's going to be there at the finish line um, immediately, but um, if we think of it as a journey, then we think about helping people along that continuum and, and helping them gain confidence and gain skills. and. And actually, I think for a clinician, that's a very important um, uh, image because um, they feel under tremendous pressure to get everybody to the finish line right now. Um, and uh, if they can see that it's about progress, it's about moving uh, towards that goal, and, and, and by meeting people where they are, um, they're much more likely to experience success with those patients. Rebecca? Well, you know, when we think about it, it's all very, as we've been talking here, it's all very individualized and personalized. We are all patients. We all want to be engaged in our health, but we need different types of support. So really be thinking about, as we go along this journey, what is it that we need? Do we need reminders to make an appointment? Do we need to make sure we ask our healthcare professionals certain questions? And as we look at tools, make sure they're serving our needs and that we're getting the support we need, not just from our healthcare professional, but from our family as well. So I think it's all about personalizing those goals of therapy. The diabetic patient doesn't necessarily you know, when they think about their A1C level, that's important, but maybe their end goal is to take a trip abroad or to make sure they're around when their grandchildren are born. So again, to be thinking about as we go along that journey, what is it that matters to me as the patient and how can I get there with the support of the healthcare team? Sandra. I think, you know, along that same vein, I think that uh, we have to look at every uh, interaction with the patient as a collaboration. It's a partnership. We're working with together to meet very specific goals and it's the goal of what's important to the patient at that time and I think that's the most critical thing and going back to how do we support um, in that but I think it has to be a collaborative dialogue something that we do together um, and again it goes back to uh, as Judith mentioned before making sure we're meeting patients where they are uh, wherever they are in their journey and really helping them um, through our skill sets and our capabilities to really reach that next level, whatever that next level may be. But it's about collaboration and communication. And Suzanne? Yeah, I would just say, I guess uh, speaking from the clinician community, that um, we need to provide support not just for our patients but for our clinicians and, and all of the people on the healthcare team so that they can respond and support patients in their you know chronic disease um, journey because and we need to uh, all learn to recognize those uh, successes along the way not just the end game because there's lots being missed along the way that point to success and um, it would be great if you know it's not helpful to give somebody information that they can't act on or they feel they don't have the skills to act on and so acknowledging to the clinician community that we do need to learn how to do this we need to learn the language of chronicity of chronic care that talking to people 
through the lens of acute care when we're talking about chronic disease doesn't work and so we should make it our, our responsibility to be better equipped to handle those discussions in our um, busy primary care frontline environments. And there you have it. That'll have to be the last word. What an inspiring dialogue. And as the sole XX in a sea of XX commentary, <laughs> I just <laughs> being in such a, a presence. Uh, so thanks, everyone. Uh, we have reached our time to close. Those of you watching online, don't hesitate to jump on the community page to discuss questions we didn't have time to get to today. You can join us on Twitter at the hashtag GreatChallenges following the broadcast, and we'll try to do our best to answer all of your questions that we didn't get on the air today. Thank you, everybody in the TEDMED community, our guests, and special thanks to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. <coughs> and saying thanks for listening, folks. Thank you. Bye Thank now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Greg.